So last week we went, went over some steps, some things that you can look at, that you should look at, that are going to help protect you. And we are going to go into this a whole lot more today. And so I want you to stick around. And if you miss anything, you can go online. You can go to craigpeterson.com. Make sure you sign up there for my email. And what I'm going to do for you is I will send you... A few different documents now we, we can chat back and forth about it uh, but I can send you this now I'm recording this on video as well as on audio so you can kind of follow along if you're watching either on YouTube or over on rumble and uh, you can find it also on my website I've been trying to post it up there too but right now let's talk about what we call passive back-end protections so you've got the front end and the front end, of course, is stuff coming at you, maybe to the firewall. I mentioned last week about customers of mine. I was just looking at a few customers this week just so I could have an idea at their firewalls. And they were getting about 10 attacks per minute. Yeah, and, and these were customers who have requirements from the Department of Defense because they are defense sub subcontractors. So again, potential bad guys. So I looked up their IP addresses and where the attacks were coming from. Now remember, that doesn't mean where they originated because the bad guys can hop through multiple machines and then get onto your machine. What it means is that ultimately they ended up coming from one machine, right? So there's an IP address of that machine that's attacking my clients or attacking my machines. It just happens all the time. A lot of scans, right? But some definite attacks where they're trying to log in using SSH. And what I found is these were coming from Slovakia, Russia, and Iran. Kind of what you were expecting, right? Uh, the, the Iranians, they just haven't given up yet. They keep trying to attack, particularly our, our military and our industry. One of the things we found out this week from, again, this was an FBI notice, is that the Russians have been going after our industrial base. And that includes, in fact, it's kind of more specifically our automobile manufacturers. We've already got problems, right? Try buying a new car. Try buying parts. I... I was with my friend just this week. I helped him uh, because he had his car, right? It, it needed to get picked up. So I took him over to pick up his car, and we chatted a little bit with this small independent automotive repair shop. And they were telling us that they're getting sometimes six, eight-week delays on getting parts, and some parts they just can't get. So they're going to everything from junkyards on out. And the worst parts are the parts, the official parts, from the car manufacturers. So what's been happening is Russia, apparently, has been hacking into these various automobile manufacturers and automobile parts manufacturers. And once they're inside, they've been putting in uh, remote control botnets and those botnets now have the ability to wake up when they want them to wake up and then once they've woken up what do they do well who knows right they they've been busy erasing machines causing nothing but havoc they've been doing all kinds of stuff in the past today they're sitting there idle which makes you think they're waiting, right? It, it's kind of like accumulate as much as you possibly can. And then once you've got it all accumulated, go ahead and attack, right? So they could control thousands of machines. But they're, they're not just in the U.S. It's automobile manufacturers in Japan as well that we found out about. So that's kind of what they're doing right now. So you got the kind of that front end and back end protections. So we're going to talk a little bit about the back end. What does that mean when a cybersecurity guy talks about the back end and the protections there? Well, I got it up on my screen right now, but here's the things you can do, okay? Remember, small businesses are just getting nailed from these guys because, again, they're fairly easy targets. One, change your passwords, right? How many times do we have to say that? And yet, about 70% of businesses out there are not using a good password methodology. Again, 
If you want more information on passwords, two-factor authentication, you name it, just email me, me at craigpeterson.com. I want to get the information out. Now, you got to make sure that all of the passwords on your systems are encrypted, are stored in some sort of a good password vault. As you really should be looking at 256-bit encryption or better. I have a, a vendor of mine that I use. So if, if you get my emails every week, you know in them there's the little training, right? And so I'll give you a five-minute training. It's, it's written. Uh, usually it's in bullet point form just to help you understand things. Well, that provider of mine has a big database. And there's another provider that I use that is for training. So the training guys use the database of my provider. Well, in using that database, they're storing the passwords. And the training provider is putting passwords in the clear into the database, which is absolutely crazy. So again, if you're a business, if you're storing any sort of personal information, particularly passwords, make sure that you're using good encryption and you're what's called salting the hash, which means you're not really storing the password, you're storing a salted hash. Uh, I can send you more on this if you are a business and you're developing software. This, this is kind of long tail stuff here. Uh, configure all of the security password settings so that if someone's trying to log in and is failing, that you know and you block it. Many of us, let, let's say you're a small business. I see this all of the time, okay? You're not to blame. You, but you have a firewall that came from the cable company. Maybe you bought it at a big box retailer. Maybe you bought it online over at Amazon. It's working really great for you. Has it got settings on there that let you say, hey, if there's 20 attempts to log in, uh, maybe we should stop them. Now, what we do personally for our customers is typically we'll block them at somewhere around three or four failed attempts and then their passwords blocked. Now, you can configure that sort of thing if you're using email, and that's an important thing to do, let me tell you, because we've had some huge breaches due to email, like Microsoft email and passwords and people logging in and stealing stuff. It, it, it was just a total nightmare for the entire industry last year. But limit the number of login retries as well as you're in there. These excessive login attempts, whatever you want to define it as, needs to lock the account. And what that means is even if they have the right password, they can't get in. And you have to use an administrative password in order to get in. You also want to what's called throttle the rate of repeated logins. Now, you might have gotten caught on this, right? You went to your bank, you went to eBay, you went to any of these places, and all of a sudden it it denied you, right? It blocked you. That can happen when your account is on these hackers' lists. Remember last week we talked about password spraying? Well, that's a very big deal, and hackers are doing the spraying trick all of the time, and that is causing you to get locked out of your own account. So if you do get locked out, remember, it might be because someone's trying to break in. Obviously, you have to enforce the policies. Uh, CAPTCHA is a very good thing. Again, this is more for a software developer. We always recommend that you use multi-factor or two-factor authentication and do not use your SMS, your text messages for that, where they'll send you a text message to verify who you are. If you can avoid that, you're much better off because there's some easy ways to get around that for hackers that are determined, okay? Uh, Multi-factor again, install an intrusion detection system. We put right at the network edge and between workstations and servers, even inside the network, we put detection systems that look for intrusion attempts and block intrusion attempts. Very, very important. 
use deny list to block known attackers. We build them automatically. We use uh, some of the higher end Cisco gear. Uh, Cisco is a, a big network provider. They have some of the best hardware and software out there and you have to subscribe to it. A lot of people complain, well I can just go buy a firewall for 200 bucks on Amazon. Why would I pay that much a month just to, uh, to have a Cisco firewall, right? It's like praying, paying for the brand, right? I got my logo shirt on here. Uh, I, I wouldn't pay for that. No, it's because they are automatically providing block lists that are updated by the minute sometimes. And then make sure you've got an incident response plan in place. What are you going to do when they come for you, right? What are you going to do? Bad boys, bad boys. Stick around. We got a lot more to talk about here as we go. I am explaining the hacks that are going on right now and what you can do as a business and an individual to help protect yourself. Don't go anywhere. Okay, guys. So there we go. There's our first for the day. Let's get going. I'm going to queue up this next one here. I'm going to pause it. Let me know if, if you prefer, I just leave this thing running. If you like to see things like my recording equipment or whatever, you know, I, 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 I like behind the scenes myself. Now we're gonna talk about prevention. What can you do in order to stop some of these attacks that are coming from Russia and from other countries? It, it is huge, people, believe me, this is a very big problem and I'm here to help. Hi, I'm Craig Peterson, your Chief Information Security Officer, and you're listening to News Radio WGAN AM 560 and FM 98.5. I'd like to invite you to join me every Wednesday morning at 7.34 for The Morning Drive. Matt and I'll get you up to date. We've reviewed a number of things that are important when it comes to your cybersecurity and your protection. We talked about the front end, we talked about the back end. Now we're gonna talk about pure prevention. And if you're watching online, you'll be able to see my slides as they come up as we talk about some of this stuff. And you'll find me on YouTube and you'll also find me on Rumble. Rumble, a fairly new platform out there, a platform that doesn't censor you for the things you say, okay? So here we go. First of all, enabling your Active Directory password protection is going to enforce password protection all the way through your business. Now, I've had some discussions with people over the months, over the years about this whole thing and what should be done, what can be done, what cannot be done. Hey, it's a very big deal when it comes to password protection. And Active Directory, believe it or not, even though it's a Microsoft product, is pretty darn good at a few things. One of them is controlling all of the machines and the devices. One of the things we do is we use a, a, an MDM or what used to be a mobile device manager called Mass360. It's available from IBM. We have a special version of that that allows us as a managed security services provider to be able to uh, control everything on people's machines. But Active Directory is something you should seriously consider. If you are a Mac-based shop like I am, in fact, I'm sitting right now in front of two Macs that I'm using right now, you'll find that Active Directory is a little bit iffy sometimes for Macs. There are some workarounds and it's gotten better. Mass 360 is absolutely the way to go. But make sure you've got really good passwords. And the types of passwords that are most prone to spraying attacks are the ones you should be banning specifically. Remember the website, Have I Been Pwned? Yeah, it's something that you should go to pretty frequently. And again, if you miss anything today, just email me, me at craigpeterson.com. Believe me, I am not going to harass you at all, okay? 
Now, the next thing that you should be doing is what's called red team, blue team. Now, the red team is a group of people, usually outside of your organization. If you're a big company, they're probably inside. But the red team is the team that attacks you. They're white hat hackers who are attacking you, looking for vulnerabilities, looking for things that you should or shouldn't be doing. And then the blue team is the side that's trying to defend. So think of kind of like war games. Remember that movie with Matthew Broderick all of those decades ago and how he he was trying to defend. That computer was trying to defend. Then it moved into an attack mode, right? Red team's attack. Blue team is defend. So you want to conduct simulated attacks. Now, conducting these attacks includes saying, oh, my, uh, let's now put in place and execute our, our plan here for what are we going to do once we have a breach, and you darn well better have a breach plan in place. So that's one of the things that we help as a fractional uh, chief information security officer for companies, right? You got to get that in place. And you have to conduct these simulated attacks and you have to do penetration testing, including password spraying attacks. Uh, there, there's so many things you can do. One of the things that we like to do and that you might want to do, whether you're a home user, retiree, or a business, is go and look online. You can just use Google. I use far more advanced tools, but you can use Google and look for your email address right there. Look for the names of people inside your organization and then say, well, wait a minute, does that data actually need to be there? Or am I really kind of exposing the company, exposing people's information that shouldn't be out there? Because remember, the hackers, one of the things they do is they fish you, fish as in PH. So they'll send you an email that looks legit. Hey, uh, let me see. I know that Mary is the CFO, and I know that Joe's going to be out of town for two weeks, and the Bahamas not a touch. So while he's gone, I'm going to send an email to Mary to get her to do something to transfer the company's funds to me. Okay, so that's what that's all about. You've you've got to make sure you know where is our information. And if you go to my company's page, mainstream.net, you'll see on there that I don't list any of the officers, any of the people that are in the company, because that again is a security problem. We're letting them know. I, I go to some of these sites like professional sites, uh, lawyers, uh, doctors, accountants, and I find right there, all of their people, right? Their top people, or sometimes all of them. And they'll say, yeah, I went to McGill University, went to Harvard, whatever it might be. It's all there. So now they've got great information to fish you, to fish that company. Because all they have to do is send emails saying, hey, remember me? We're in Harvard. We're in this class together. And, and uh, you know, did you have so-and-so as a professor? Did you see how that works? Okay. Uh, you also want to make sure that you implement what's called a passwordless user agent. And this is just so, so effective. If they cannot get into your account, right? What's gonna, what could possibly go wrong? But one of the ways to not allow them into the account is to use biometrics. We use something called Duo, and we have that tied into the single sign-on. And the Duo single sign-on works great because what it does now is I put in, I go to a site, I put in my username, and it pulls up a special. A splash page that is running on one of our servers that again asks me for my duo username. So I've got my username for the site, then my duo username and my duo password, single sign on, and then it sends me uh, to an app on my smart device a request saying, Hey, are you trying to log into Microsoft uh, and you know, whatever it might be at Microsoft? And you can say yes or no. And it uses biometrics. So those biometrics now are great because it says, oh, okay, I need a, a face ID or I need a thumbprint, whatever it might be. That allows a generalized a passwordless access, okay? Passwordless meaning no password. 
So that, those are some of the top things you can do when it comes to prevention. And if you use those, they're never going to be able to get at your data because it's something you have along with something you know. It, it works great. And we like to do this. Um, some customers don't like to go through those hoops of the single sign-on and using Duo and making that all work, right? We're, we're fine with it, right? We've got to keep ourselves at least as secure as the DOD regulations require, uh, unlike almost anybody else in the industry. But, you know, I'm not going to brag about it. But some of our clients don't like to meet the, the tightest of controls. And so sometimes they don't. I hate to say that, but they just don't. And it's a fine line between getting your work done and being secure. But I, I think there's some compromises that can be readily made. We're going to talk next about saving your data from ransomware and the newest ransomware. We're going to talk about the third generation that's out there right now, ransomware. It's getting crazy, let me tell you, and what it's doing to us and what you can do. What is a good backup that has changed over the last 12 months? It's changed a lot. I used to preach 321. Well, there's a new sheriff in town. Stick around. CraigPeterson.com. 321. That used to be the standard, the gold standard for backing up. It is no longer the case. With now the third generation of ransomware, you should be doing something even better. And we'll talk about it now. Hi, I'm Craig Peterson, your Chief Information Security Officer, and you're listening to News Radio WGAN AM 560 and FM 98.5. I'd like to invite you to join me on the Morning Drive Wednesday mornings starting at 734. We're doing this as kind of a simulcast here. It's on YouTube. It is also on Rumble. It's on my website at craigpeterson.com because we're going through the things that you can do, particularly if you're a business, to stop the Russian invasion. Because as we've been warned again and again and again, the Russians are after us and our data. So if you missed part of what we're talking about today or you missed last week's show, make sure you send me an email, me at craigpeterson.com. This is the information you need if you are responsible in any way for computers. That means in your home, right? Uh, certainly in businesses because what I'm trying to do is help and save those small businesses that just can't afford to have full-time true cyber security personnel on site. So that's what the whole fractional chief information security officer thing is about, right? Because you just, you can't possibly afford it. And believe me, the guy that comes in to fix your computers is no cyber security expert. And these people that are attacking are full-time cybersecurity experts. And they're coming from every country in the world including the coming from the U.S. We just had more arrests last week. So let's talk about ransomware quickly here. Ransomware, very big problem, been around a long time. You know, the first version of ransomware was software, got onto your computer through some mechanism, and then you, you had that red screen. We've all seen that red screen. And it says, hey, pay up, buddy, right? It says here you need to send so many Bitcoin or fraction of a Bitcoin or so many dollars worth of Bitcoin to this Bitcoin wallet. And if you need any help, you can send email here or do a live chat. There, very sophisticated uh, we we should talk about it some more at some point that was one generation one generation two was well not everybody was paying the ransoms so what did they do at that point well they said well let me see if they we could ransom the data by encrypting it and having them pay us to get it back 50% of the time ish you got all your data back okay not very often 
uh, not often enough, that's for sure. Or what we could do is let's steal some of their intellectual property. Let's steal some of their data, their social security number, their bank account numbers, etc. They're in, in a, an Excel spreadsheet on their computer. And then we'll, if they don't pay that first ransom, we'll tell them if they don't pay up, we'll release their information. Sometimes you'll pay that first ransom and then they will hold you ransom a second time, pretending to be a different group of cyber terrorists, okay? Number three, round three is what we're seeing right now. And this is what's coming from Russia, near as everything we can tell. And that is they are erasing our machines totally erasing them are pretty sophisticated ways of erasing it as well so that it's ex in, it really it's impossible to recover it, it's sophisticated in that it it doesn't delete some key registry entries until right at the very end and then reboots the computer and of course there's no computer left to reboot right it, it's lost everything off of that hard drive or ssd whatever your boot device is so let's talk about the best ways here to do some of this backup and saving your data from ransomware. Now you need to use off-site disconnected backups, no question about it. So let's talk about what's been happening. Hospitals, businesses, police departments, schools, they've all been hit, right? And these ransomware attacks are usually started by a person clicking a link in an email now this is a poison link most of the time it used to be a little bit more where it was a, a word document an excel document that had something nasty inside microsoft as i've said many times has truly pulled up their socks okay so it doesn't happen as much as it used to plus with malware defender turned on in your windows uh, operating system you're going to be a little bit safer next up uh, a program tries to run okay and it effectively denies access to all of that data because it's encrypted it and usually what it does so that your computer still works is it encrypts all of you like your word docs your excel docs your databases right all the stuff that matters and once they've got all of that encrypted you can't really access it yeah the files there but it looks like trash now this new disturbing trend has really developed over the last few months so in addition to encrypting your pc it can now encrypt an entire network and all mounted drives, even drives that are mirroring cloud services. Remember this, everybody. This is really a big deal because what will happen here is if you have, like, let's say you've got an O drive or G drive or some drive mounted off of your network, you have access to it from your computer, right? Yeah, you click on that drive and now you're in there on, in the Windows side. Uh, Unix and Macs are a little different, but you know, same general idea. You have access to it. You have right access to it. So what they'll do is any mounted drive, like those network drives, is going to get encrypted. But the same thing is true if you are attaching a USB drive to your computer. So that USB drive now that has your backup on it gets encrypted right so if your network is being used to back up and if you have a, a, a thumb drive a usb drive it's not really a thumb drive right it's an external drive but connected by usb hooked up and that's where your backup lives you're in big trouble because you have lost it and there have been some pieces of software that have done that for a while and when they can encrypt your network drive, it is really going after a whole bunch of people because everyone that's using that network drive is now effective, effective and it is absolutely devastating. So the best way to do this is you obviously you do a bit of a local backup we will usually put a server at the client site that is used as a backup destination 
okay so that servers the destination all of the stuff gets backed up there it's encrypted it's not on the network per se right it's using a special encrypted protocol between each machine and the backup server and then that backup servers data gets pushed off site some of our clients we even go so far as to push it out to a tape drive which is really important too because now you have something physical that is by the way encrypted that cannot be accessed by the attacker at all it's off-site so we have our own data center that we run that we manage that no one else has access to it is ours and we push all of those backups off-site to our data center which gives us another advantage if a machine crashes badly right the hard disk fails heaven forbid they get ransomware we've never had that happen to one of our clients just uh, we've had it happen prior to them becoming clients is that we can now restore that machine either virtually in the cloud or we can restore it right onto a piece of hardware and have them up and running in four hours it can really be that fast but it's obviously uh, more expensive than, than some people are looking to pay. All right, stick around. We've got a little more to talk about when we come back. What are the Russians doing? How can you protect your small business? If you're a one-man, one-woman operation, I believe it, you've got to do this as well, or you could lose everything. In fact, I think our small guys have even more to lose. CraigPeterson.com. Okay, so that's that. We got another to go here. Backups are important. We're going to talk about the different types of backups right now. What you should be doing, whether you're a one person little business or you are a multinational. Obviously, scale matters, but. Hi, I'm Craig Peterson your chief information security officer and you're listening to news radio wgan am 560 and fm 98.5 like to invite you to join me on the morning drive wednesday mornings with matt at about 7 34 we'll keep you up to date Protecting your data is one of the most important things you can possibly do. I have clients who had had their entire operating account emptied out, completely emptied. It's just amazing. I've had people pay a lot of money to hackers to try and get data back. And I, I go back to this one lady over in... Eastern Europe who built a company out of 45 million dollars all by herself and of course you probably heard about the Shark Tank people right Barbara Cochran how she almost lost four hundred thousand dollars to a hacker in fact the money was on its way when she noticed what was going on and was able to stop it so thank goodness she was able to stop it right but she was aware of these problems, was looking for the potential, and was able to catch it. How many of us are paying that much attention? Now, one of the things you can do that will usually kind of protect you from some of the worst outcomes when it comes to ransomware is to back up. And I, I know everybody says, yeah, I'm backing up. It's really, really rare when we go in and we find a company's been backing up properly it, it even happens to us sometimes right we, we put a backup regimen in place and things seem to be going well but then when you need the backup oh my gosh we just had this happen a couple of weeks ago well actually this yeah last week this is what happened we have something called an fmc which is a controller from cisco 
that actually controls firewalls in our customers locations this is a big machine it monitors stuff it's tied into this ice server which is looking for nastiness we're bad guys trying to break in right it's intrusion detection and prevention and tying it into this massive network of a billion data points a day that cisco manages okay it's absolutely huge and we're running it in a virtual machine network. So we have two big blade chassis full of blades and blades are, each blade is a computer. So it has multiple CPUs, it has a whole bunch of memory, it also has in there storage. And we're using something that VMware calls vSAN. So it's a little virtual storage area network that's located inside this chassis and there are multiple copies of everything. So if a, a storage unit fails, you're still okay. Everything stays up, it keeps running, right? And we have it set up so that there's redundancy upon redundancy. Well, one of the redundancies was to back it up to a file server that we have that's running ZFS, which is phenomenal. Uh, let me tell you, it is the best file system out there. I've, I've never, ever, ever, ever had a problem with it. It's just crazy. I can send you more information if you're ever interested. Just email me at craigpeterson.com anytime. Be glad to send you the open source information, whatever you need. Um, but what had happened is somehow the boot disk of that FMC, that, that firewall controller, had being corrupted so we thought oh okay no problem let's look at our backups <clears throat> yeah hadn't backed up since october 2019 yeah and we didn't know it had been silently failing obviously we're putting stuff in place to stop that from ever happening again so we are monitoring the backups the that network of disks that was making up that storage area network that had the redundancy failed because the machine itself somehow corrupted its file system. ext4 file system, right? They're not supposed to be corruptible, but the journal was messed up and it was, man, what a headache. And so they thought, oh, okay, you're gonna have to reinstall. And we were sitting there saying, oh, you're kidding me. Reinstalling this FMC controller means we've got to configure our clients' firewalls that are being controlled from this FMC, all of their networks, all of their devices. We've got to put it all. This is going to take a couple of weeks. So because I've been doing this for so long, I was able to boot up an optics disk disk and mount the file system and go in manually underneath the whole FMC, this whole firewall controller, and make repairs to it, got it repaired, and then got it back online. So thank goodness for that. So it happens to the best of us. But I have to say, I have never had a new client where they had good backups ever, ever okay that and now that should tell you something so if you are a business a small business whatever it might be check your backups double check them now when we're running backups we do a couple of things we go ahead and make sure the backup is good so remember i mentioned that we have a backup server that sits on site usually depends on the size of the client right but sits on site at the client's site so it will perform the backup it then tries actual restore of that backup to make sure it's good and we can even for our clients depending on what they want right so a higher level if a machine goes down let's say it, it catches fire right or disk uh, explodes in it or completely fails we can actually bring that machine online inside our backup server at the customer site yeah how's that for fancy and bring it back online in in just a matter of minutes instead of days or weeks so that's true too if that machine had been uh, ransomed had had its data erased whatever might have happened to it uh, we can restore it now we've never had to knock on wood except when there was a physical problem with the machine and as a rule 
starting from scratch we can get that machine the new machine online in four hours or less and it's really cool the way it works if you like this stuff man it is great okay protecting your data i'm rambling a little bit here you need an archival service uh there's companies out there like iron mountain you can at your local bank depending on the bank it ain't like it used to be get a box right a special box in the vault that you can put the tapes and other things in nowadays there's cloud options virtual virtual tape backup options which is <clears throat> a lot of what we use and we do okay we also use straight cloud at the very bottom end again it's not located on the network it's up in the cloud it's double encrypted uh, it's absolutely the way to, to do. Now, if you're going to have a backup, and if that backup you want to be secure, it must not be accessible, okay, to the attacker. You've got to put some literal airspace between your backups and the cyber criminals. It's called an air gap. So there's no way for them to get to it, okay? Now, I want you to consider seriously using tape. These uh, LTO, these linear tape drives, they've been around for a long time, but they're cartridges you can pull in and out, and they're huge. They, well, they're physically small, but they can hold terabytes worth of data. They're absolutely amazing. There's some great disk-based backup systems. That's kind of what we do. Uh, some of them have been around a long time, and they can be quite reasonably priced, all right? So it's something for you to consider but you've got to have at least that air gap in order to make sure that you're gonna be protected. What should you be looking for in a backup system? Well, this is called 3221, which means maintain at least three copies of your data, store the backups on two different media, store at least one of the copies at an offsite location, store at least one of the copies offline, and be sure to have verified backups without errors. Okay, does that sound a little complicated? 32110 is what it's called. It used to be 321, now it's 32110. I can send you, Karen put together a special report on this based on our research and I can share that with you absolutely free. Hey guys, if you want it, you got it, but you got to ask me, just email me, me at craigpeterson.com. This is absolutely essential. If you're a small business, a tiny business, uh, to do it this way, let me tell you, okay, this is, this is just huge. Uh, physical backups should be stored off-site. I mentioned the bank vault. A lot of people just go ahead and take them home with them. That might be a disc. It might be a tape. It can be a little bit complicated to do. And I've picked up customers that thought they were backing up. They were using a USB drive. They were putting it in dutifully every Monday. And then every Wednesday, what happens? Well, every Wednesday, they bring in Wednesday's disc. And then they bring that disc home. And then Thursday, they bring in the Thursday disc, right? And none of them had been working. Okay, so be very, very careful. All of your backups should be encrypted. Uh, we encrypt it at the customer site, and then we re-encrypt it when we bring it over to us, okay? Keys are essential, particularly if you're using a cloud-based backup. Don't use the same keys across multiple backups. Very important there. Uh, you should have some good procedures that are well documented. Uh, test, test, test your restorers because very frequently we find they don't work. In fact, that's the number one problem, right? If they had just tried to restore even once from their backup, they would have known they had problems, right? And get those backups scheduled on a regular schedule. Okay, so there, there's a lot more uh, offline backups and more that we can talk about another time. But this is important. If you want any help, send me an email. Just put backups in the subject line. I'll send you some stuff. Email me, me at craigpeterson.com. Now, I am more than glad to help pretty much anybody out there. I'm not going to help the uh, Vladimir Putin, right? 
but uh, anybody else I'll help. But you got to reach out, okay? Uh, you listen here, and I know some of this stuff is over some of our heads, some of your heads. You're the best and brightest. That's why you're listening, and I'll help you out. I'll send you some information that's going to get you on the right track. Me, M-E, at CraigPeterson.com. That's Craig Peterson, S-O-N. Have a great day. Okay, guys, that is it for the show here. So thanks for being with us, and thanks for sticking around and watching and letting people know about it. And let me know as well what you think. Pros, cons, things you think I should do, things maybe I shouldn't do. And uh, you can just do that at the same address, me, M-E, at CraigPeterson.com. Take care, and thanks for your support.